Okay. Uh, so thanks everyone that's joining. Uh, welcome to today's CNCF webinar. The topic is lowering the barrier to Kubernetes proficiency, nav navigating the stormy seas of information overload. So uh, my name is Sanjeev Rampal. I'm a principal engineer at Cisco and a CNCF ambassador. I'll be moderating today's webinar. Uh, we would like to welcome our presenter today, Angel Rivera, developer advocate at Circle CI. Uh, before we started, get, get started, a few housekeeping items. During the webinar, you won't be able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. Please note the Q&A box is different from the chat box, so please use the Q&A box for questions. Um, this is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add, any, add anything to the chat or the Q&A panel that would be in violation of the Code of Conduct. Basically, please be respectful of all your fellow participants and presenters. Uh, please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinar page, which is at cncf.io forward slash webinars. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Angel to kick off today's presentation. Thank you, okay. Sanji. I appreciate it. Uh, well, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm hoping everyone's uh, safe and healthy uh, during these hard times with uh, COVID-19. And hopefully um, this presentation will <laughs> educate you a little bit on, uh, on the barriers of entry to Kubernetes and then uh, how, to, how you can uh, you know, navigate the stormy seas, I guess. Uh, in full disclosure, I was thrown into this a little bit. I had a co colleague who was supposed to present today, but uh, he's unable to due to the crisis. So uh, yeah, we're gonna have some fun here. So, uh, all right, starting already. <laughs> all right, so here's a quick agenda. Basically, I'm gonna cover why Kubernetes, right? Talk about um, the reasons why uh, you would use Kubernetes or, or you know, basically the business reasons why uh, you would use uh, Kubernetes. And then we're just gonna jump into a very high level introduction uh, into Kubernetes. Uh, where I will go into discussing uh, basically like a teardown or decomposition of Kubernetes and discuss the different components uh, that comprise Kubernetes. And then uh, the last topic will be implementing Kubernetes uh, where I will give you some uh, basically advice on, on the things uh, that you will need uh, as far as like human resources, um, assets, and even uh, adopting uh, certain uh, modern uh, practices and principles in software development to help you, uh, you know, with your Kubernetes uh, uh, migration. Uh, so yeah, so uh, my name is Angel Rivera. I'm a developer advocate for Circle CI. Uh, my background: uh, I started my career off in the United States Air Force. I was uh, working in U U.S. Air Force Space Command, which I believe now is U.S. Air uh, U.S. No, sorry, U.S. Space Command. It's really hard for me not to say the Air Force part. Uh, but basically, uh, again, I started my career off programming professionally there, uh, and I've been doing it for a very long time. Uh, my experience with Kubernetes, uh, I, previous to working for Circle, I was a DevOps engineer uh, or manager uh, with the previous company I was at, uh, and that's where I actually uh, started, uh, uh, well, working with Kubernetes professionally. Uh, in, in full disclosure, I haven't really been playing with it that much, uh, you know, as, as far as like full-scale production uh, Kubernetes, uh, but I have uh, touched on it here and there during um, my tenure at Circle CI because I do a lot of demonstrations and talks uh, about DevOps and tooling. So um, <clears throat> let's get started. So why would you use Kubernetes? Uh, I know it's a fancy new buzzword uh, and folks, you know, I speak to a lot of folks in the community. Uh, that's part of my job as a developer advocate. And I learn how folks are using technology and the reasons why they're using technology. And I also often help them with problems and, and the struggles with technology that they have. But again, um, a lot of the questions that I ask for folks when I'm, I'm discussing uh, technology with them is, especially if Kubernetes comes up, is I ask them why, why, why would, why do you, why are you interested in it? What problems do you have? 
Uh, and again, folks are, you know, describing problems. Um, and anecdotally, a lot of responses that I get, I thought I'd share with all of you is, you know, hey, this is the new hotness, right? I'm a tech junkie and um, Kubernetes appears to be, you know, the new hotness, the new cutting edge technology uh, to run applications. Uh, and, you know, a lot of folks, as we do, right, when we're new, we get it wrong. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, these are just like, again, anecdotal uh, reasons why folks are, are interested in Kubernetes. Uh, another one is keeping up with the Jones, Joneses, meaning, you know, uh, they're probably a part of teams that are innovative, right? They consider themselves very innovative, cutting edge, and they need to be competitive because there's other folks uh, in their same industry uh, that are also competitive and cutting edge. So that's another anecdotal uh, a reason that I often get right from from the community and in my discussions. And finally, right, I think we all probably seen this one, whereas, you know, the boss is basically telling us or our leadership is telling us, hey, we need to be innovative. Uh, and they probably sat on a on a on a webinar just like this and decided that, you know, uh, yeah, that's Kubernetes stuff. We need to put that in our environment and, 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 and make it run. Right. So um, again, these are all anecdotal, but some of the common reasons, right, and, and I would say more more serious reasons, and, and by the way, those anecdotal excuses or reasons uh, that people are interested in Kubernetes, they're totally fine, right, no judging there, but um, these, these are the more kind of serious conversations that I've had, right, so teams want to work faster uh, as far as, you know, the getting their software uh, delivery uh, processes to be to be much faster at a higher velocity, right, and, and being able to shorten those release cycles. So that's a really good reason, right, to, to look at Kubernetes. If you wanna cut infrastructure costs, that's another good reason. So back in the day, uh, we used to run, uh, you know, if we wanted to scale out an, uh, 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 an infrastructure, we would have to add physical servers, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But, um, you know, by deploying Kubernetes, you definitely save some money, especially if you're running things at, at a huge scale, right? And then this is one of the most, uh, I would say, popular uh, reasons why you should um, run Kubernetes again is, is basically improving the availability of your applications and their scalability of, and the scalability of your infrastructure that run those applications. So now I'm going to dive into Kubernetes. And by the way, if anyone um, has any questions, I'm gonna, this is going to be a little bit long, this portion. Um, but uh, please ask the questions there. And if um, one of the moderators could just call out um, if there's a question in, in the Q&A and I'll, I'll just stop and answer it very briefly if I can. Um, so yeah, just put your questions out there. First thing I wanna talk about is uh, the, the acronym K8. So uh, I started using Kubernetes years ago. I mean, even like we're, we're in, this, in this developmental phase uh, and I always wondered what this k 8 thing stood for. And I was at a Tekton conference in New York for CoreOS years ago, and they brought it up and they said, well, this is what k 8 stands for in a presentation, which was awesome. So I wanted to share that with folks because I still encounter folks who don't really understand what the k 8 acronym is. And it's basically, uh, it's just the, the, the letter K, right, stands in Kubernetes, and then um, the S, which is at the end of the Kubernetes, and then the characters in between, there's eight of them, so that's where they get the number eight. So K8 is just essentially the, the characters in between the K and the S in the word Kubernetes. So for those of you that didn't know, that's what it is. So let's, before I go deep dive into the uh, Kubernetes uh, world, um, or yeah, in the Kubernetes world, uh, let me get, talk about how we used to uh, deploy software. So back in the 90s, when I started uh, in this industry, uh, you know, I used to deploy software in the traditional sense, right? So if I know it's covering, the letters are covering, but if you look to, I guess, your left, um, in the traditional deployments, we would literally have multiple applications running on a, a rack of servers or, or, a, or a server asset, right? So um, that was fine until you started gain, you know, needing to scale that up, right? So if you had a lot, if your workload or your load uh, increased on that application, the only way to scale that was literally to buy new servers, 
right? Buy new storage, buy new memory, buy a new rack, <laughs> buy new network switches and install all of that stuff, right? And then, uh, you know, connect it uh, with the network, right? Get all that networking um, stuff out of the way. Uh, it was a really ter a very complex and, and tough uh, provisioning process, right? To get that hardware up and running. Uh, then came along virtualization, right? So uh, that helped us tremendously because we were able to now run um, these applications in isolation, meaning um, the, the introduction of this, uh, of this hyper, what we call a hypervisor, right? So it's a middleware between the operating system and the hardware. So the hypervisor was uh, basically orchestrating um, all the resources that the, the server had. So now you could squeeze a lot more, um, uh, app, you know, a lot more uh, performance out of, out of a single unit uh, because of the virtualization, it, kn it knew how to uh, allocate uh, resources, right? When the, when the system was under load, a certain application was under a certain load, um, the, the virtual machines would then, you know, uh, be able to do a lot better job of handling the resources and, and managing them between the application loads. Uh, and then fast forward to today, which I think, there we go, we're in the container deployment uh, uh, era, right? So now um, it's, it's very similar. So if I had to remove this letter from here, <laughs> you could see that um, in the container deployment block, it's basically the container runtime. So what that in essence is, is Docker or, or, or container D, right? These are the runtimes that are, that are actually managing uh, the containers uh, when they're running. So um, containers are really lightweight, right? So, uh, and, they, and they tend to handle the uh, resources on the system a lot better, in my opinion, than a, than a hypervisor uh, because they are so lightweight. And these applications run in a single process, which gives you the ability to uh, manage, right, your resources a lot better than even uh, virtualized uh, hypervisor type uh, scenarios. So, this is a quick definition I got uh, off of uh, Wikipedia regarding uh, Kubernetes. Uh, one of the cool things about Kubernetes is that it is open source, right? And it is a container orchestration system platform, right? Uh, and basically what, what it helps you do is uh, deploy your applications and scale them as well as managing it, right? So it eases that whole process from one platform. Whereas uh, before you would have to set up to a bunch of different systems, right, to do all of this, if you wanted to not have any kind of manual uh, touch points. And even then you would still have uh, these manual touch points, right? So if you needed to deploy an application, uh, a lot of times, you know, even with deployment software, I, I would have to click a button or, you know, do something like that. But with Kubernetes, it kind of takes all of that out of the way and handles it for you once you kind of, um, have everything set up and configured. And that's the whole point of Kubernetes, to ease uh, the operation of your, of your application. So let's talk about Kubernetes and the critical components or the core components of Kubernetes. I wanna kind of do a little teardown of it uh, and talk about the, uh, the, the again, the, the core components that uh, compose Kubernetes. So Kubernetes operates under the cluster concept. So that means um, you have a, a, an asset that's kind of controlling uh, some uh, sub assets, which we'll get into a little bit later. But basically, it, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty confident most people here know what a cluster is. Uh, so we'll, we'll skip that one. Um, and if you look at the diagram in the back, uh, for the most part, you have, uh, in, within that, that Kubernetes cluster, you have what we call master nodes or control plane nodes and then you have worker nodes, right? And within those worker nodes, you have pods. Now the worker nodes are where all the, the main work happens, right? Uh, what we're doing in the worker nodes is where we're running the containers, which are running your applications. We're also running, uh, you know, uh, any kind of uh, process intensive um, cluster type operations. Uh, again, the, the worker nodes are, are actually the muscle, right, for, for Kubernetes, to, you know, to put it in, a, in a lighter terms. And within those worker nodes, we have pods. Now, pods are I, the, the, the lowest, or I would say the simplest object within Kubernetes. What pods do are basically 
uh, orchestrate or manage your containers, right, when they're running uh, loads. So um, at, at the lowest level uh, is, is a pod within Kubernetes, right? Just to keep that in perspective. So the control plane, like I said, is, is pretty much um, the, the, the brains of Kubernetes, right? So uh, everything, all the services that actually are, are running your cluster are running in the control plane. And it has components, right? So these are the services within the control plane uh, sector that I'm going to be discussing in the next few slides. So the first thing is um, Kubernetes API server. Uh, one awesome thing that I'm really, really happy with uh, Kubernetes as a developer is that they took an API first approach to developing the system. Uh, and what that gets you is a lot of uh, capabilities, right? So uh, everything you do can be, can be accessed and, and uh, yeah, through, through an API. And you can control things through this API as well. So having that capability in the API server is really awesome, uh, again, for um, you know, just normal operating and then also being able to extend what Kubernetes does. Uh, so that's a component in the service that's in the control plane. The other piece is, uh, or a component is etcd, which is uh, basically Kubernetes kind of persistence. Um, so when you have a cluster and you have all these assets working within the cluster, you need to share information, right? And that information has to persist. And the way that it happens is using this service, which is called etcd. This is also another open source project uh, that I believe is under the uh, Linux Foundation or CNCF. Uh, if you don't, if you don't, if you've never heard of it, check it out. It's really cool. I think it was started, it was started by the uh, folks at CoreOS before they got acquired. Um, but it's a really cool project and uh, it's a key value store service um, and enables you to, again, push around bits of data between your assets in the cluster and also uh, persist that information. So that everybody's kind of in coordination, right? And here's another component, the Kubernetes uh, cube scheduler, which is basically uh, ensures that you're, your system is actually uh, deploying uh, or actually making sure that uh, your pods are alive and well and, and, and that there's, uh, you know, it schedules the work. So if you have uh, an asset that's not really being used uh, or it doesn't have any work happening, a worker node that's not having any tasks assigned to it, then if your load goes up, the Kubernetes schedule will identify all the nodes that have resources available and will start scheduling jobs or tasks, meaning, you know, standing up pods and then your containers will run in those assets. So the cube scheduler is definitely uh, really cool and helpful uh, in helping you to have that kind of, um, you know, set it and forget it mindset in the sense that, you know, you don't have to worry about the system or your system not, not functioning properly because the cube scheduler will go ahead and initiate uh, jobs and pods uh, within, within the, uh, the worker nodes if, if there's, if it, if it needs to. So um, the queue control ma controller manager, it, it has, this is a little bit more uh, complex. Uh, it has, it rolls up a lot of services uh, under it, um, which are basically uh, loops, right? So these are applications that are running in a loop and constantly monitoring for different things. So one of them is a node controller, right? So it's, basically looking for any um, nodes that are not responding or nodes that have gone down. And that's, again, a service, right? And then it lets the system know what's going on. The other piece of this, uh, or another uh, component could be uh, the replication controller, right? And it's maintaining the correct number of pods for every replication controller object in the system. Um, and then finally, uh, one of the other uh, controller, uh, cube control manager uh, services are, uh, are the service account and token uh, controller, which basically um, it, uh, it accesses tokens uh, for new and it creates new tokens for new uh, namespaces. So these are all like, again, subsystems within the controller manager, but um, it, they're really important in helping uh, the system actually, you know, uh, uh, operate uh, what they call automatically, uh, right, behind the scenes. But I thought I'd highlight some of that stuff because um, folks, you know, just hear about Kubernetes, but they don't really 
realize what's going on underneath the hood, which, uh, by the way, I recommend you do anyway. So um, that was the Cube Controller Manager piece. Uh, now I'm going to talk about the Kubernetes node components. So these are the services that run on every Thank node. You, uh, sorry to interrupt. Before uh, you go ahead, there's been a few questions. Do you want to maybe? Oh, yeah, sure. A couple of those. Yeah, that's great. Let's go ahead and I, I'm trying to see where these can, the questions are. But can you read me the question, uh, Sanjeev? Yeah, sure. Yeah, the first one was, can you have uh, multiple parts for a worker node? So I've answered that already, that yes, you would. Yeah, that's, that's correct. And what was the other uh, one? Second question was, does the HCD database hold all of the deployment YAMLs that we enter into the API? Ooh, good question. <laughs> Uh, do you know the answer to that, Sanjeev? Yeah, I guess basically the resources that the deployment YAML creates are what Gee, are persisted uh, in the HCD uh, database. And the deployment itself is a resource as well. Uh, that's right. Okay, yeah, that's what I thought. I just wanted to confirm, like I said, I <laughs> haven't really touched it, but uh, that's right. So, so you feed it, uh, the data structure is YAML, but it, when it gets uh, imported into etcd, it doesn't stay in that data source, does it, Sanjeev? Yeah, it's the deployment resource is what is uh, <clears throat> archived as a, a JSON in the etcd database. Yeah, right. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah, it turns it's converted back to JSON, right, or into parts are serialized. And okay. uh, Stefan, Stefan has another question. What happens when the master node goes down? <laughs> well, that's where you would have to have uh, a multiple. Uh, I would I would recommend right if you're doing a deployment to production, obviously having multiple uh, control planes. But uh, at, at that point, that's where etcd kicks in. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Sanjeev. The you 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 bring that node back up if you don't have a failover. That sh etcd should right repopulate uh, most of that information unless there's some security. Yeah. So if bits. the master node is not using HA that means if it's a single master node, um, the worker nodes will continue executing the pods that are already scheduled. Right. So at least the workloads that are already scheduled will continue to run in a best effort manner. Um, very often completely, uh, completely transparent to the master node going down. Of course, you won't be able to schedule new nodes or a new pods and so on and take new API requests. Um, so you typically want to run the master in an HA configuration, um, but at a minimum, at least the worker nodes will continue running the pods, even if the master goes down. And they just had another question. I think we'll get back to the presentation after this one. <clears throat> when pods are deleted, um, is the pod information deleted in the HCD? Or, sorry, I'm not able to follow the question here. I think they're trying to ask if the, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but if the container is is terminated, will the information persist on the system? Is that maybe what they're asking? If, if, that's, the, if that's the question, then um, once the container is terminated, Unless you have uh, per mounts persist, right? The container, uh, uh, some persistent layer mounts in that container, then the data is gone, right? So it's a stateless, generally runs stateless, unless you have um, a, 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 a uh, requirement where you need to run, uh, like you know, a mounting of an EBS volume or some some volume to it. Uh, but I yeah, think I think the other thing to note is that very often you wouldn't deploy a pod manifest directly, you would deploy something like a deployment or a replication controller. So in that case, deleting an individual pod would simply cause that pod to get recreated. Uh, but if you do create a resource of a pod by itself, and if you delete it in, in the API server, then yes, it does get deleted in etcd as well and eventually cleared out in the kubelet as well. That's right. I think let's continue. I think it looks like there's a bunch of questions and I'm sure we'll get to more later. Yeah. So, Thanks, yeah. Sanjeev, for helping me out on that one, man. <laughs> Appreciate it. Okay, so um, let's see. So it's talking about the node components, right? Um, so right, 
Sanjeev just mentioned Qlets. And Qlets are basically the agents that are running on all the nodes in the Kubernetes cluster. So the Kubelets, again, are, are basically ensuring that your containers are running in pods. Let's go back one. So Kube proxy. Now, Kube proxy is basically the network, network fabric within Kubernetes, right? So that's a, a service um, that maintains your network rules and allows um, the communications to and from pods inside the cluster and out, right? So again, Kube proxy is a, more of a networking layer uh, within Kubernetes, which if you remember what, I'm, what I was describing earlier when I was doing traditional deployments back in the day, um, and, and you know, I was talking about wiring up new network capabilities, switches, and, and all that good stuff. Um, yeah, this is where Kubernetes does a really good job of taking care of all that for you, right? Right out of the box. So you don't even have to really think about it to a degree. Uh, just have to configure it and make sure that those configurations stay intact. And then finally, um, another node component is the container runtime, right? So again, this is just basically uh, where your the, the the software that runs um, your container, and it's usually Docker or Container D on Kubernetes. So um, before I go into the benefits of of Kubernetes or some of the, 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 yeah, the benefits of Kubernetes. Is there any other questions, um, Sanjeev? Maybe we can hit real quick. Yeah, so <clears throat> Ramazan asks, um, what is the best product practice for production apps? Would it be to run HA master and multiple workers for multiple apps or separate master and worker nodes for each app? Hmm. What would be a best practice? Yeah. So I, I think it, I think it, it, it would depend on everyone's like, situations are different. I actually ran both uh, in my previous life in both configurations, just due to um, a lot of had to do with, uh, you know, depending on where we were. So we were in production, I guess is talking to production. Uh, we ran, I ran uh, multiple HA, right, uh, uh, clusters to make the, the, or control planes to make sure that, you know, we had uh, the fault tolerance we needed and also that uh, the system was available uh, at all times, uh, obviously, right? So um, I guess the answer is I would definitely go with the uh, option where, you know, you have the, the highest availability, especially in production. Um, I don't know if I answered that right, Sanji. Do you have a any? Yeah, no, I think Angel, you got it right. I would. The only thing is, I would add is um, you some some deployment practices use one app per cluster. If you want that app to be totally isolated from other applications and create multiple clusters, um, but very often you may want to choose, let's say, an application per namespace within Kubernetes. And I think Angel may have some slides on namespaces later. And that way you can support multiple apps within a single cluster. So there are various degrees of sharing within a, a Kubernetes cluster. And depending on the scenario, each of those can make sense. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have any that detailed uh, in this presentation, but that there's tons of documentation on how to, how to run that stuff. Um, and I'm, I'll have some resources uh, later on. So um, yeah, let's jump into uh, the benefits of, of, of Kubernetes. Um, so you, what you get out of the box with Kubernetes is uh, automatic service discovery, right? And load balancing. So the service discovery piece enables you to uh, expose containers via DNS, right? Uh, or, or IP address. And uh, with the load balancing capabilities, it basically distributes your network traffic evenly, right? So you're not getting, you're not, you're not hitting a, a certain, re pounding on a certain resource uh, when the load gets heavy, right? Uh, the system knows that, hey, I need to equally distribute this traffic so that, th it, that it can maintain a, a, a efficiency, right? Or optimized performance. Um, the other piece uh, for ben the benefits of, of circles of uh, circles yeah, of Kubernetes is uh, the storage orchestration. Like I mentioned earlier, 
um, you can mount and and uh, different types of, of storage units like uh, elastic uh, block storage from Amazon or any other cloud provider out there um, and also right if you have uh, local storage right that you want to use you could do that in a, in a very easy manner uh, and then kubernetes will orchestrate that as well for you right um, this is one of my favorite features, um, the rollouts and rollbacks type features where, you know, if you, you have a, a, a container that, you know, an application and a container that you need at a, in a certain state, meaning it needs to, let's say you have a new release of, of your application. Generally, you would create a new, a new, uh, a new uh, container or a new uh, Docker image or right, uh, application image, Docker image, uh, and then you would roll that out. Now, if you're using like a Canary deployment um, uh, approach where you just update or, or you know, roll out these new releases to a specific amount of folks, uh, you know, like let's say you have a hundred or 10, 10 nodes working uh, in your cluster, and you you want to roll out to ten percent, right? Every 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 you want to update uh, ten percent in a ten percent increment. Um, then, right, you would do one at a time because you have ten nodes, ten percent. Um, the system will go ahead and say, "All right, I have a new." Um, you schedule up a new uh, deployment, and then it will just start uh, updating as as you know, start draining a node. Uh, once uh, once the load is is at pretty much zero. Uh, Kubernetes will then start deploying these applications, these new releases via container to these these uh, these uh, nodes, and then you know progressively uh, then then shift the traffic over to the new updates. Now, if you have a failure in these rollouts, so let's say you're getting halfway through your Canary deployment, and um, uh, you know you realize, wow, we have a problem with the application, uh, you can just as easily deploy, you know. A, a rollback, right? So meaning you just deploy the old version of the application again, and that uh, Kubernetes will handle that for you uh, automatically, right? So in a nice automated manner. Um, so that's one of my favorites. This actually saved my butt quite a bit of times in production when I was running uh, Kubernetes. Uh, yeah, so automatic big packing. Basically what this is, is um, obviously, right? So you have to set a threshold for, for resources, meaning CPU and memory for your containers. And what Kubernetes does is automatically, right, figures out uh, the allocation and then tracks it. And then if there is a open slot, let's say you need to, you know, stand up a new container, excuse me, a new pod, uh, the, the bin pack will go ahead and, and find the slot for you and, and start uh, deploying the application within that, right? And it manages, again, like for, for CPU and memory, uh, it's a really nice feature. Uh, whereas before, uh, I used to have to manually like keep track of things or set up a, a system that wasn't really that great at reporting back. And then, you know, was a, there was a lot of manual uh, and, and, and uh, manual handling of, of this type of work. Uh, but with, with a system like Kubernetes, it's all kind of handled for you. Uh, the other piece is self-healing. So what that means is if for any reason, you know, a container just runs out of memory or CPU or there's just a bug in the software and it, it's terminated or dies, um, Kubernetes will automatically right, replace it um, or, or restart it. Now, it'll also, um, if it has an unhealthy container, right? so this Kubernetes actually, you can even set parameters to say like, look, if, this, if containers are performing at a certain uh, metric, right, uh, at a diminished capacity, then Kubernetes can you, can, you can tell Kubernetes to go ahead and at a certain threshold, right, terminate that and then replace it with a, with a healthy container. Uh, and then the last piece is, which is again, a, one of my favorites is the secrets management of Kubernetes, right? So now you can actually, uh, you know, configure Kubernetes and store uh, secrets on the platform itself without having to expose them. Meaning, so like, let's say uh, you wanna update, a, you have a token for maybe a third party integration that you have in your application, you could actually, um, you set that up where you, you know, insert the secret into the system. And then uh, when you're, when you're deploying your, uh, your pod, you could actually have a placeholder in your manifest for the deployment in the YAML that basically has placeholders, right? So if you have like a, a username or password or, or a API token, 
you could just put the, uh, I think they're called mustaches or handlebars around it, um, which are the braces. And then, you know, that's a signifier that, uh, you know, it's a secret that needs to be uh, populated once the system uh, serializes it into uh, etcd. So that's basically the benefits of Kubernetes. Um, now I'm going to be talking about implementing Kubernetes, right? And some of the reasons, and some of the things that you're going to need uh, to, to really think about and, and, and before you even start trying to go into production with things. So let's talk about skill sets first, because let's face it, without people and without people with skills, uh, you're not going to be deploying anything in production right? you know, as far as Kubernetes goes. So um, first things first, I'm a big fan of security. Um, so definitely have a background or have some knowledge in security and role-based access controls. Um, that's the way Kubernetes operates. So having you know, some knowledge in, in that space is, is definitely uh, something that I would highly recommend uh, so that you, know, you understand how the system is actually um, protecting itself and also doling out uh, uh, permission and privileges. So definitely have to learn uh, about YAML, right? So it's a big part of this. Um, I know there's ways you can do it, uh, other mechanisms, but YAML is a very, it's a data structure, right? It's not a programming language. So, but it's a very declarative uh, data structure. So you can actually, you know, um, uh, define things in a human readable manner. Um, these configuration files can tend to get uh, a little bit verbose if you're doing, um, you know, many things or trying to do many things in one, one YAML file. I've seen a lot of different approaches. I prefer to have separate files for the different things I'm doing. So if I'm having a, maybe I want to, you know, uh, create a new namespace like Sanjeev talked about, I'd do it with a YAML, a separate YAML file. Uh, or if I want to deploy, uh, you know, a new pod or something like that, I definitely would use uh, separate YAML files for different, different kind of transactions within Kubernetes. That's one of the recommendations I'd make. I would definitely, definitely, def this is really important. We're, we're, if you think about what Kubernetes is doing, it's orchestrating containers. So you'd need to have a deep understanding of Docker, right? You need to understand how to build images. You need to understand how, to, uh, how, how the networking works, right? Like support so forwarding commands. You need to also uh, understand how to mount volumes if that's something you're gonna be doing. Um, right, all of these things uh, will will are definitely required uh, for you to, to to accomplish the things you want to accomplish within Kubernetes. I can't tell you how many times I speak to people who have tried many many times to deploy Kubernetes, and then it becomes abundantly clear to me once I'm talking to them for a few minutes that they have no clue about containers and they really don't have an understanding, which is which is a shame. Um, and then I tell them, hey, you know, you probably might want to spend a little time learning how, uh, containers and, and, and that technology so that you have a better understanding. And sure enough, you know, I see them a few months later, maybe a year later, and they, you know, commend me for giving them that advice and it did help them in their uh, Kubernetes journey. I would also recommend that you have a strong, uh, at least fundamentals, right? L know the fundamentals of networking because uh, that's going to be a lot of what you're doing uh, within the system. Uh, again, it's, it's handling it for you for the most part, but there are uh, some fundamentals that you need to understand like IP addresses, again, firewall rules, uh, you know, load balancing is something, you know, again, you don't have to be an expert at it, but you need to understand uh, the basics and how all of those things interact so that you're well prepared for, for handling uh, Kubernetes. Uh, APIs, if you're not familiar with application programming interfaces, definitely get familiar with them because uh, uh, it's, it's, like I said, uh, it's an API first approach uh, with Kubernetes. And um, again, it's, you know, it's something that you really should have a, a, a good grasp on uh, if you're gonna operate a Kubernetes uh, cluster. Yeah, uh, understand storage. Um, you know, this is probably not so important, uh, but at the end of the day, I think uh, if you're gonna do anything that, you know, you wanna save data or your application has some state to it, uh, you're definitely gonna wanna understand how this all fits together, uh, you know, in a sense. Uh, this is really important as well. Uh, 
can't tell you how important this is or stress how important this is. Uh, if you stand up a cluster and you don't have proper monitoring or logging, you're not going to understand uh, what's happening with your system if things go wrong, right? So uh, definitely look into uh, some of the options. I think Kubernetes has, it's been a minute since I, I actually used it, but uh, and Sanjeev, maybe you can speak to this, but they have uh, improved some of the monitoring tools uh, or features in it. And also you can use third party tooling as well, which I also recommend if, you know, uh, if you need like a lot more telemetry or specifics, uh, but definitely get familiar with monitoring logging because this is going to be where uh, you know the rubber meets the road if you have issues with your with your Kubernetes cluster. And I think this is the last, uh, I guess, uh, uh, skill set. Uh, definitely look towards um, infrastructure as code. Uh, please, please, please uh, look into codifying all of your infrastructure. This will help save you so much time. It's a little bit of work up front. But at the end of the day, once you have the infrastructure codified, you can you can do you can save a lot of time, right? And and also you can sleep rest well at night knowing that you know uh, if you have an issue and it's related to any kind of like provisioning or or you know uh, mistakes you made, maybe you used the wrong wrong uh, resource class in your in your uh, your assets uh, for for the cluster. You can go ahead and fix that, right? Super simply, uh, just by changing a few characters in your code and then submitting that, right, to um, to change the the back the infrastructure to to the appropriate uh, level. Uh, one of the other things I definitely want uh, folks to understand is that when you're using Kubernetes and you want to gain velocity, you're going to also have to adopt uh, modern day uh, software development practices like continuous integration, continuous delivery, and DevOps practices. Um, so with uh, CICD, right, you're basically enabling uh, your, your developers to confidently secure test, build, deploy, monitor uh, all the code that they, and all the releases that they, that they build, right? And then you can iterate on that, meaning, so if you're secure, if you're testing the release while you're building it, right, uh, in, in uh, continuous integration principles, then you'll know you have a feedback loop, right? You'll know when your, your software is broken and you need to fix it. And then once you have that fix in place, it runs through this whole process again. Uh, so it'll be, again, security. What I mean with security is, you know, you're running something like Sneak and Sneak will test uh, your application, check for any dependencies that have uh, vulnerabilities, right? So it'll stop your build and tell you, hey, you have security uh, vulnerabilities before you even get to the phase of testing, right? So these are all uh, components of, of, of continuous integration, continuous delivery that are, are critical. And if you want to, uh, you know, again, gain velocity and, and develop software faster, you're going to have to adopt, understand and adopt these uh, CICD principles. And then when it comes to DevOps, right, you just want to automate everything, meaning, you know, to gain that velocity, uh, you're going to have to to implement tools like that's what Kubernetes does. It, it, it automates a lot of the work that we used to do manually. Uh, so again, have that automate everything mentality when you're trying to, uh, you know, innovate and and uh, bring uh, again velocity to to your operation. So the last bit I want to talk about is um, the different flavors of Kubernetes. So when I started. Um, I tried to do this. I tried to self-host Kubernetes. And when I started, Kubernetes was in its, I don't want to say infancy, but close to it. And there wasn't a lot of resources out there. It wasn't as widely supported as it is today. Uh, and that was because it was so new, right? And folks were still juggling between like, uh, was it Mesosphere and, and Kubernetes, right? These are, that, that were, those, were, those were the two kind of top dogs during the time I, got, I started using it. And this is very difficult though, right? So if you're gonna do a self-hosted solution with Kubernetes on your first run, right, into production, I would, I would rethink that strategy. And this is just coming from experience. Um, not that, you know, you couldn't accomplish it, but when you do a self-hosted uh, Kubernetes um, uh, implementation, you're responsible for everything soup to nuts, right? That, that means uh, hardware, or if you're in the cloud, right, the, the resources, that means you're gonna have to wire up all of the uh, networking, you're gonna have to make sure you have fast enough disks, you have to have fast enough processors, enough memory, right? All of these things 
if you're doing like in a, in a physical data center, um, which, which I speak to a lot of folks who still do that, and especially in corporations, and they have reasons, right? But at the end of the day, um, they're moving away from that, like these physical data centers, and they're going into this uh, cloud native or cloud provider type, right, uh, uh, scenarios. Uh, so again, if, if, you're, if you're doing, uh, you know, thinking about doing a self-hosted Kubernetes, especially for your production environments, um, you know, do your due diligence, do your homework on what it takes to actually do that. There's tons of blog posts and, and, and folks in the, in the community, in the industry that have done, done this and they actually operate like this. And you can get a real good sense of, of what it takes to actually do this, right? Now, your other option is what I call a managed uh, Kubernetes service, right? So these are things like um, uh, Google uh, Kubernetes engine. Uh, what's this one here? Elastic Kubernetes service from Amazon. I believe Azure Kubernetes service. LKE, which is a Linode uh, Kubernetes engine. And, I, and I'm DKE, I, I was assuming it's DigitalOcean. I could be wrong, but I just threw it in there anyway. So if you're a DigitalOcean digital fan, um, they also have uh, offerings, right? So what these gain you is the ability to, you know, easily use um, uh, their services. So um, they kind of abstract and, and the, the control plane for you. So that makes it a little bit easier, right? Instead of you having to manage that. And, 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 I mean, you still have to manage it, but at the end of the day, you don't have to uh, provision it, uh, right? You can easily bring uh, infrastructures up and down with using our Kubernetes infrastructures up and down using these services. And that's one of the, the nice things about it, right? It just takes away all that manual uh, process that you, you, you have to do. You have to do. Uh, again, with the networking, right? You still have to manage, um, you know, the networks uh, as far as like rules and stuff within these services, but you don't have to have, you know, a lot of, you don't have to put a lot of brain power behind it. And that's what, that's the benefits you get uh, from using a managed service. So if you're, if you're going into your first foray into, into Kubernetes, I would definitely highly recommend that you you know look into one of these services um you know and then you know trying to build your skills on that and then move on to uh if you're going to do a, a self-hosted uh, environment then then you have that experience that you could build on to then you know go into uh, deployment that's self-hosted um yeah and one of the things that uh i learned early on too and and these resources didn't exist when i was um deploying kubernetes with my team and, and we were operating with it. Um, definitely look into, uh, again, uh, the containers. You have to understand containers to, to really appreciate what Kubernetes is and actually use it effectively. Um, uh, Ubuntu's come out with this mini K8s, which is a, a, a designed to be a single install type of Kubernetes environment for developers, right? So that you can run these um, Kubernetes infrastructures. You can actually develop it and, and run it locally uh, before you go into any kind of production scenario, any kind of staging environments, right? These are all designed to be uh, local. Uh, I actually heard of someone deploying a service in production using Minikube a couple years back. And it, I can tell you, it did not end well for that person. So don't take these tools and try to, you know, use them uh, in production. Uh, that's a big, I, that's a big risk in my opinion. And the person that, you know, did this, yeah, he paid a deep price for, for, for it. Uh, and you know, it, it was a mistake. He learned from it, but I, I'm just letting you know, like, you know, th these tools are here for basically learning and also, uh, you know, understanding the system and then also developing, right? So you can use them to develop against, uh, you know, a future Kubernetes infrastructure or something that you're going to deploy but do not <laughs> try to refrain or refrain from using these in production. I think that's it for me. Uh, I don't know what we have some time or we're over, huh? <laughs> but uh, I, I can take some questions if people are still around um, and thank you. Uh, thanks Angel, that was great. I think uh, we definitely need lots of these uh, presentations uh, to share knowledge about Kubernetes. We've had a few more questions come in. I'm not sure how much time we have to get through those, but let's try. Um, Jonathan asks, would be nice to know a battle-tested storage solution that is ACID compliant and responds well to scaling. So I think he's asking both about storage and a database solution that is ACID compliant and 
what would be recommended for Kubernetes deployments? Yeah, D databases, I, I can tell you from my experience, uh, and it's still, I think I, I checked it a couple months ago. Um, I, I, I tend to warn people against not uh, trying to deploy databases in Kubernetes uh, because of the persistence, uh, even though it does have like uh, great features for, for storage orchestration, I, I feel for a database, it does, you know, there's, there's, there's some impediments uh, because, you know, things are, are, are virtualized. Um, I, I, it may work for you up to a certain point, but once you start getting like heavy load and, and huge queries and data is pushing through that database, uh, you're just going to see huge problems with performance. I don't know, Sanjeev, have you had that same uh, experience? I would say that, and also I think the question was both about general block storage and databases, it wasn't particularly clear. So there are definitely okay. various block storage solutions, um, some of which are sort of the scale out hyper-converged type solutions, as well as network attached solutions. So there's a, there's a wide range of options, uh, some of which you would want to run in the Kubernetes cluster and some of which you may want to run outside of the Kubernetes cluster for performance. Yeah, and, and again, if you if you're doing the the this the, the latter, running them outside of your Kubernetes cluster, you have to make sure that uh, you have the the throughput that you need right uh, for your network, because um, again, uh, these are the things that stumbling blocks that I encountered. And back in the day when I was running uh, Kubernetes, there was only like two or three vendors that was doing, um, you know, block storage type orchestration, and it wasn't that great. Uh, but things have obviously progressed, uh, and, and since there's huge adoption, right, vendors are making huge strides to 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 offer uh, really good performance uh, storage solutions. But again, you know, um, everything has a price, right? And and you have to constantly monitor, uh, again, bandwidth your and, and your data, right? How much, how many bits you're pushing through per transaction, uh, because that stuff adds up. And if uh, you know, if you're if you're going to clog you can clog your, your, your plumbing, basically, if, if, if you're not careful. Um, another question is, Kates versus serverless. Why would, when or why would we prefer Kates over serverless? Yes, yeah, so you can run those serverless frame, uh, infrastructures on Kubernetes now. Uh, isn't there, uh, I'm not too familiar with the open, or the uh, serverless uh, world, but I believe there's one called OpenFAS. Um, and I believe you can run that, um, that uh, serverless framework inside of, of Kubernetes. It, I've, I've read a couple blog articles about that. I haven't had any experience myself with it, uh, but if you all want, uh, you see my Twitter handle, just tw tweet me and I can, I can point, I know tons of people who do it and I can point you in the right direction to get you the, the proper answers for that question. Uh, there was a question on what was the name of the security code scanner that you mentioned, Angel? Oh, sneak. So it's N S N Y K, I think dot IO or dot com. So S N Y K dot IO dot com. Yeah, those guys are pretty cool. And they just hired, uh, I don't know if you know Patrick Dubois, who's who's the man who coined the term DevOps. So he's now working over there, which is pretty cool. Uh, I met Patrick a few times. Nice guy. Uh, but the product is pretty solid. It's the one I've been using lately. So uh, check it out. It's open source as well. Um, let's see. There were a few other questions which were slightly generic. Yes, the, the slides in the session will be made available. Uh, question on what certifications might be available for people to obtain. Oh, Sanjeev, I, I think you're more qualified than me. I, I don't have any certifications. So... <laughs> Can't answer that one, or I don't know, to be honest. Um, the CNCF has a couple of uh, certifications, certified Kubernetes admin and certified Kubernetes application developer. I think those would be uh, very worthwhile to pursue, and you can look them up on the CNCF website. Um, again, a bunch of questions about how, what are the best options for beginners to get started, pointers to tutorials, blogs, I guess Kubernetes.io is a good starting point and there's lots of blogs and YouTube videos. Yeah, so I, I put it, if you go here to Kubernetes.io community, uh, I, this is where I go to look for, for resources. Not only do they have their stuff on there, um, there's other, you know, they also refer to other folks too that are 
active in the community. Um, and there's, there's a ton of, um, there's a ton of resources out there uh, that'll give you an even better explanation than I did, I'm sure, uh, on Kubernetes. Um, I think any of these, like if you look at Minikube and, and Mini K8s, you'll see it'll just, you know, cascade into different um, resources as well. And I'll just okay. leave that up for folks if they want to screenshot it or whatever. Are we might have time for one, one or two one more questions? All right, cool. Um, is Kubernetes HIPAA compliant or the Kubernetes services are HIPAA compliant? Ha ha ha. You, well, I, I think the way HIPAA works is uh, you, you have to kind of uh, implement, right? Uh, the, 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 uh, the, what do you call it? The, uh, I guess the, um, the HIPAA compliance. You, so what I'm trying to say is the, the owner of the system is responsible for making the system compliant, right? Uh, so there are tools I know, I used to work in the federal government and I, I, I dealt with this HIPAA process all the time. Um, you know, vendors, they say they're HIPAA compliant and when, what that means is, yeah, they're, they're basically building, or they're, they're, their software operates at a certain level, like so everything's encrypted at rest and in flight, or um, you know, it has role-based access controls. So I don't know the answer to that, to be fair, but um, you know, if you're really trying to get HIPAA compliant, um, you know, the owner of the system has to kind of make sure the system is, 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 is uh, deployed in a manner that's compliant with HIPAA uh, from, you know, the way I used to operate. Uh, one of the things that uh, I believe there's a ton of um, healthcare systems already using them, the federal government's using it as well. And there's a ton of resources like from DOD as well that you could actually look up. So if anybody has any um, questions about that, I would refer you to NIST. I believe it's NIST.gov. It's N-I-S-T.gov. And they'll have all of the regulations, all the HIPAA you know, compliance, and they'll have recommendations as well uh, for, for you know, locking down systems like Kubernetes, Linux, uh, Windows. So it's the standards that the government operates on. Um, so yeah, if, and by, again, if you tweet at me uh, at Punk Data, I'll get you, uh, I'll, I'll at least send you the links to, to some of that stuff so that people can have it. Okay, great. That's, I think, the all the time we have. Thanks, Angel, for a great presentation. Oh, thank uh, you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. The webinar recording and the slides will be online later today. We look forward to seeing you at a future CNCF webinar. Thanks, everyone, to the, at the CNCF, and thanks, and have a great day. Bye.